För mig är det alltid lika roligt att stå här och säga välkommen. Dels att se så många som jag känner igen, men också att det faktiskt blir en hel del nya ansikten varje år. Vi har över 400 besökare i år och det är sjätte året som vi kör Forum för forskningskommunikation eller FFF som vi brukar säga. Jag tycker också att det är en härlig känsla att få tillsammans med er ägna en hel dag åt forskningskommunikation. Jag vet att det är inte alla som riktigt har den tiden att få göra det, men den här eftermiddagen så ska vi bara prata forskningskommunikation. Och vi ska lära oss lite nytt, hoppas jag. Vi ska inspireras och vi ska också nätverka och träffa varandra. Mitt namn är Anna-Maria Flitod och jag kommer från Vetenskapsrådet. Vi som arrangerar Forum för forskningskommunikation är dessutom Vinnova, Forte, Riksbankens jubileumsfond, Mistra, Strategiska stiftelsen och Vetenskap och allmänhet. FFF är ju också en del av Vetenskapsfestivalen som hade sin stora invigning igår. Och jag frågade Jenny Törner, som är eh, verksamhetschef för festivalen, om hon inte kunde skicka med hennes bästa tips. Och hon svarade så här. Om någon är nyfiken, någon gillar det oväntade och inte har varit på vetenskapsrouletten, så tipsar de om att göra det, att besöka den. Det är alltså, man fyller hela eh, den här, eh, vad heter det, Lisebergshjulet. Och så går man in i en gondol och i varje gondol så sitter det en forskare. Man har ingen aning om vem man kommer att möta. Man har ingen om, aning om vad man kommer att få, få liksom lyssna mer till eller diskutera. Så det är verkligen en utmaning och otroligt roligt koncept. Eh, men det är inte bara vetenskapsrouletten. Hela den här veckan är fylld av spännande, massor med spännande eh, programpunkter där spännande forskning möter samhällets medborgare. I år har festivalen temat Vad är vi? Eh, men för FFF har vi inte haft något tema, men vi har haft ett eh, arbetsnamn och det har varit pop-up PCS10 och nu undrar ni eh, kanske vad det är då eh, PCS10 eh, står då för Public Communication of Science and Technology och det är den största internationella kan man väl säga då konferensen där praktiker men framförallt forskare träffas och där man just bara diskuterar de senaste rönen inom den här disciplinen forskningskommunikation, som är en disciplin i sig själv. I år var den i Nya Zeeland, vilket innebar att det var många av oss som inte hade möjlighet att åka dit. Så då tänkte vi, varför inte bjuda in några av talarna därifrån? Och de kommer sen att prata just om utvecklingen inom forskningsområdet, forskningskommunikation. Vilka utmaningar står vi inför? Hur ser forskningsfronten ut? Och sedan i de här parallella sessionerna så kommer vi mer att prata om samtida koncept för att sprida och väcka intresse för forskningen. Så varmt välkomna till våra svenska talare. I would also warmly like to welcome Maja Horst, uh, Alexander Gerber, but also Erik Jensen. Even if his performance was before lunch with a workshop on evaluation. And the feedback I got is that it was very much appreciated. Uh, The, the three of them have just arrived from New Zealand, so I think it's great that they actually came all the way to Sweden, a, a bit uh, jet lag there. And we are very eager to have them here and to listen more about uh, the latest about research within this discipline. Uh, Maya just came out with a book. I'm sure she's going to talk more about it, but I will want to really warmly recommend it. Uh, I just loved it. Uh, men i år 
så har jag också glädjen att stå här tillsammans med Etel Forsberg från Forten som är GD, generaldirektör där. Och då tänkte jag så här, Etel, kan inte du berätta lite mer om varför ni är med och stödjer Forum för forskningskommunikation och hur du ser på forskningskommunikation? Tack Elisa, äh, Anna-Marie Anna äh, och tack för möjligheten att få komma hit och äh, prata och få svara på den frågan. Äh, vi finansierar ju forskning inom hälsa, arbetsliv och välfärd. Och det här är frågor och utmaningar som berör oss alla och äh, där det fattas väldigt många beslut varje dag i stort och smått som är, som där det krävs egentligen evidensbaserat underlag äh, men där det många gånger saknas. Och eh, forskningskommunikation, din fråga, eh, är viktig i hela kedjan, i hela processen från att eh, få möjlighet att göra en utlysning, att diskutera vilket område som eh, forskningsutlysningen eh, ska gälla eh, under forskningens genomförande och när forskningsresultatet presenteras och ska göras tillgängligt. Dialogen med målgrupper, med eh, ja, olika berörda, från professioner till olika patientgrupper och så vidare, är jätteviktigt att ha innan en finansiering sker. Bara för att identifiera och fånga upp och diskutera och analysera forskningsbehoven. Vilka forskningsfrågor är det egentligen som vi behöver för att möta de utmaningar som finns i samhället? Så att, och sen naturligtvis när, när resultaten finns och att se till att detta blir tillgängligt. Det är så här vi växlar upp nyttan med forskningsfinansiering just genom forskningskommunikation. Väldigt väsentligt. EUs forskningskommissionär Carlos Moedas pratar i dagarna i, i dessa tider ganska mycket om demokratisering av vetenskap och forskning. Och i mina öron så pratar han då också väldigt mycket om forskningskommunikation. I den här meningen jag just pratade om att föra en dialog, skapa en förståelse och en insikt hos var och en av oss att förstå att om vi deltar i den här diskussionen, om vi talar om vad vi tycker att vilka utmaningar som forskningen ska ägna sig åt så är vi också med och påverka utvecklingen av vetenskap och av forskning och prioriteringarna. Att vi ställer upp och deltar och medverkar kanske i forskningens genomförande men också är med att vi, vi finns med och diskuterar resultaten. På detta sätt, det för, för vår forskningskommissionär så handlar det här ju naturligtvis om att skapa en motkraft mot fake news och till ett mera, att bibehålla det öppna samhället som är evidensbaserat. Men det har med vår demokrati att göra. Forskningskommunikation är viktig där. Vi kommer, både alla ni som sitter här i publiken, våra fantastiska talare som bara väntar på att få komma upp, kommer att berätta om goda exempel. Och jag ser fram emot också att få mingla och lyssna till flera exempel. Jag tog faktiskt med mig ett eget. Lite fräckt kanske, okay. men eh, vi jobbar ju ständigt och, och gör kunskapssammanställningar för att just få fram upp diskussionen om forskningsbehoven och låta många gånger forskarna själva komma till tals. Då hade vi senast här nu ett tema intellektuell funktionsnedsättning och arbete och vi gör det som vi brukar göra, vi gör vår publikation, arrangerar seminarier och så. Men denna gången så målgruppsanpassade vi också kommunikationen. Så här är en liten forskning i korthet för intellektuellt funktionsnedsatta om intellektuellt funktionsnedsatta i arbetet. Så jag hoppas att få lyssna till era goda exempel och naturligtvis de spännande föreläsarna som ni har bjudit in. Tack. Tack, Etel. Det är verkligen härligt att höra en generaldirektör prata så positivt. Det är som musik i mina öron när du pratar om forskningskommunikation. Med det så vill vi lämna över till dagens två moderatorer som vanligt är Helena och Anders. Välkomna ut. Där. Tack så mycket Anna-Maria och Etel. Ja. Vi vill naturligtvis också hälsa välkomna till Forum för forskningskommunikation som alltså, eh, som Anna-Maria sa, arrangeras för sjätte året i rad. Och 
som på bara några år har kommit att bli Nordens största konferens för forskningskommunikatörer. Det tycker vi är värt en applåd, eller hur? Ja, absolut. Det är verkligen jättekul att se så många här. Och jag vet inte, hur många av er är här för första gången? Toppen! Varmt välkomna, särskilt till er, men naturligtvis också till andra som har det här som en liten vårlig tradition att komma till Göteborg. Vi hoppas vi är ett gott intryck nu då. Ja, absolut. Hörrni, förra året så var temat tillit och faktaresistens. Och det är ett ämne som knappast har blivit mindre aktuellt under det här året som har gått och som naturligtvis är en stor utmaning för oss som jobbar med forskningskommunikation. I år ska vi blicka framåt. Hur ser framtidens forskningskommunikation ut? Vilka kanaler och uttryckssätt är framgångsrika för att nå Tänk specifika målgrupper eller alternativt en bredare publik. Och vilka fallgropar borde vi akta oss för? Mm. Just bra att du sa det där med nya kanaler, för jag kom på att jag måste uppdatera min Insta-story här. Så att eh, om eh, du skulle kanske kunna hjälpa till, ni kan alla kanske skulle kunna hjälpa till då, säger vi så här. Och så här ser det ut när det är fullt. Som ni nu alla vinkar. Härligt. Så får vi... Eh, Toppen! Jättebra! Så kommer jag publicera det här på min Insta-story. Eh, A. Salman, ni kan följa mig där på Instagram. Perfekt! Så fick jag lite nya följare. Mm. Appen på nya kanaler. Ja. Och app på nya kanaler så har vi en app. Ja! Vi, eh, för första gången i år så har vi då en konferensapp. Och vi tänkte bara kort gå igenom hur den fungerar. Eh, ni har ju alla använt den första delen i appen, vilket är er biljett. Annars så skulle ni inte ha fått sitta här. Eh, sen om man scrollar vidare så kan man då trycka på start och då får man generell information som man behöver under dagen. Wi-Fi och eh, hashtag och sånt där som ni vet. Eh, klicka vidare så kommer ni till programmet och där hittar ni information om hålltider och hur dagen kommer se ut. När ni klickar på talare så får ni upp biografier på de talare som kommer att framträda här under dagen, både här på scenen och i de parallella sessionerna. Sen får man liksom scrolla vidare lite med fingret där på, på appen och då kommer man till deltagare. Och då ser ni vilka som är här och vilka som ni kanske vill mingla lite extra med i pausen och under minglet senare idag. Scrolla vidare lite extra så ser ni också eh, era val, de eh, sessioner som ni har anmält er till och om ni har anmält er till minglet. Jag har tydligen bara anmält mig till minglet, ser det ut som. Eh, Jag på, Anders. Ja, jättebra. Eh, sen kommer vi till ytterligare en liten sak och det är interaktion med Mentimeter och den kommer vi återkomma till alldeles strax. Och sista fliken så hittar ni då eh, Twitterflödet från eh, konferensen. Och det har nog fyllts på lite mer än när jag tog de här skärmdumparna från telefonen. Vi hoppar tillbaka till den här eh, delen med interaktion. Därför att vi tänkte att vi skulle börja med att ställa en liten fråga till er alla som ni gärna får svara på via appen. Och då trycker ni in den här koden 859099. 85 90 99 och då kommer ni få en fråga där att svara på som vi kanske kan få upp på skärmen nu. Och frågan är vilken är den största anledningen till att du besöker forum forskningskommunikation i ett ord? Vad kan det vara? Kan det vara inspiration? Kan det vara nätverkande? Kan det vara för att Mingel. det är Mingel. Eller för att det är gratis? Jag vet inte. Kompetensutveckling. Svara fritt. Ska vi se vad som dyker upp här. Ja, inspiration leder ju än så länge. Ja, det börjar fyllas på här. Eh, ni, som inte, ni som har kommit hit idag och inte har fått någon personlig biljett på mejlen. Ni kan gå in på menti.com menti.com i webbläsaren och trycka in samma kod. Så menti.com i webbläsaren och trycka in koden 859099. Oj, oj. oj, där händer det grejer. Inspiration och kompetensutveckling verkar vara de starkaste anledningarna.
Vad kul! Och det för oss ju lite snyggt över på nästa punkt i programmet faktiskt. Ja. Den kan ni också förbereda er att gå vidare till genom att klicka på nästa fråga. Därför där har ni nämligen möjlighet att under den kommande stunden här ställa frågor till våra två keynote-talare. Och ni kan ställa flera frågor om ni vill. Och ni får gärna skriva in dem på engelska. Svenska går också bra, så översätter vi. Och ni får också gärna kanske skriva in en parentes och markera om är det någon särskild av talarna ni vänder er till eller vill ni ställa en öppen fråga till båda. Och så kommer vi i frågestunden efteråt att ta upp några av de här frågorna, så många vi hinner. So, our first speaker spent two decades in science journalism and science PR before going into science research. And today he is coordinating Europe's only three-year science degree program at Rheinwald University in Germany. Please, a warm welcome to Professor Alexander Gerber. Yeah, that's me, I think. Not up there. Lovely to be here. Well, thank you very much, first of all, on being photographed already for the invitation. Um, I think I have about 20 minutes to share a few ideas with you. Can you hear me reasonably well? Way up to the back. Must feel like cinema. All right, better use this. I've got my Twitter handle here in case you want to tweet. That's in Psycho, the Institute for Science and Innovation Communication. You can actually browse this Prezi, this presentation while I give it, which means you can fast forward me, pause me, ignore me. Um, you decide in which speed you want to um, uh, yeah, absorb this presentation. It's bit.ly um, slash vitfest18. Might take a minute or so because it's a large flash file which needs to buffer. Why are we here? Why are we running a science festival? Why do we actually do what it is that we're doing? What drives science communication in the year 2018? <clears throat> well, I would argue that there are four main aspects. The first one is that researchers are, some of them, convinced that this is something that you should be doing. You should be relating what it is that you're doing to what society thinks and what they need. So there's a big element of intrinsic motivation, both in the researchers, the STEM practitioners, and in you colleagues, you guys, in doing what it is that you're doing. Um, a few uh, aspects of the opening last night actually reminded me um, to last minute drop a few slides in here, because the overall objective of the festival, as it was communicated, seemed to have been um, to celebrate science. Fair enough, it's um, neither an immoral nor an illegal um, aspiration, but it is a very clear statement, we want to celebrate science. Yeah? Is this really the only objective of having a science festival? That is, I think, what I would like to address um, by going through these questions. Because I was wondering whether there's a certain discrepancy between, on the one hand, wanting to celebrate something, and then, for those who are there, the intensity of the very reflective way of discussing the ethical, the legal, the social implications of, uh, um, of AI, of artificial intelligence that we were having. So on the one hand, questioning the very trajectories of technological development, and on the other hand, wanting to celebrate something because it's inherently good. Yeah? So this, um, also from my dear colleague from the MIT, who I would say had a pretty technological determinist uh, approach to assuming that everything will be fine and that we just need to, to follow suit and be optimistic, whereas we, from the communication point of view, would consider science to be some of the most socially constructed things ever in, in human history. So that, I think, was a discrepancy which I wanted to point out um, before I dive into um, uh, those things. The colleague at MIT reminded me a bit of a case I've uh, made a while ago, and that is a physicist everyone knows. Yeah, that's Brian Cox. It was a um, TV talk show in Australia called Q&A, and he was confronted with climate skeptics. So what did he do? He pulled out those, I mean, literally, charts, printed out charts, and held it into the faces of the people. Now, I just leave it like that uncommented. You can probably already tell what the effect was. Because on the other hand, you have someone like Jenny McCarthy or here Jim Curry for the cinema goers, VIPs who have a totally different approach. They are, are um, uh, anti-vaccines, if you want, vaccination 
opposed. They think that this is very closely related to the MR, that the MR, MRR vaccine is very closely related to, um, to autism. And um, when Jenny McCarthy sits on a panel like this in a talk show um, and is asked for, yeah, but there's scientific evidence, the best, ava best available evidence tells us that there's no such relation and the Wakefield paper has been retracted. And so the whole story, she says, you know what? My evidence is at home and he's called Sam and it's my son. And that's the end of that discussion. Because as soon as you have evidence against emotion, emotion almost always wins, and there are very good reasons, psychologically, sociologically, why that is the case. Our job as scholars is to understand why that happens and to provide evidence for those trying to communicate the science to have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't before you try it out. Second aspect would be Policymakers want to improve the appreciation of what's going on. In the end, we're investing in Sweden probably, I don't know, 10 billion euros, crowns, into research. There's a lot of taxpayers' money going into the field. That has to be justified, even legitimized to some extent. So the impression I had last night from the Minister of Science, to some extent, was, again, there's this war on science. And even, I mean, the National Ge Geographic is not necessarily a political magazine. Yeah? If even those publications um, start having that perspective, here's Sean Otto, a good friend of mine who started in 2008, but then became the largest political campaign in the history of the United States, the um, science debate. Uh, he wrote two books about it, Fool Me Twice and Now the War on Science. So that's, it's a bit of an American thing, but if you want, it's, it's a... It's a rationale and it's a rhetoric that I think we're hearing also in Europe. Well, that's also what I threw in short notice, last minute, not only because Sweden is on the top of this list here, this is what we call civic scientific literacy. How many people actually know that the Earth circles the sun and not the other way around? How many people know that tomatoes also contain genes if they're not genetically modified? All of these kind of simplistic scientific um, um, uh, questions, mainly knowledge-based. Um, as you can see, Sweden doesn't seem to be performing too badly. This is the European average down here. <clears throat> For those who have some statistical background, I can already see Eric frowning somewhere in the audience, um, you're missing the scale, right? Which is, of course, coming, and that's part of the joke. Because even if you consider yourself to be top on the, of the list, and that's a meta study, this is, uh, I think, uh, John D. Miller, who actually took most of the um, uh, science literacy studies in the field, combined them in a meta study, and then um, tried to convey that on average, not even every second person is able to answer those very fundamental scientific questions correctly. So there's a political drive in what it is that you're doing and why you essentially have a job and a budget. There's a systemic one, and that's the increasing institutional competition because we're moving from fundamental funding to project funding and to programs and calls and so on. We've, we did um, recently, we, it's actually not published yet, so that's one of the first times I actually showed that slide. Um, we did a um, highly a representative uh, survey among science communication directors, decision makers in Germany, and asking them for their main um, goals in communicating. And there was a long list, like there were 13 items, these are just six which were selected here, um, and we're asking them how important is that on the Likert scale, and you can already guess that this is actually the order of what came back, because 93% said it's about branding, it's about institutional, positioning the institution as we are the best in class in, let's say, synthetic biology, and that is why we need the funding, whereas things like fundraising, um, scientific literacy is already way further down the line, um, and what we, from a scholarly perspective, and also what the science policy makers very much would like to see is a more dialogic understanding of why don't we have a sign, uh, societal discourse on what the implications and the goals of science in general are. So that is not high on the agenda of communication managers as such. There's a regulatory element that um, increasingly institutions funding science are interested in also understanding how the impacts are being communicated. Again, us asking about target audiences of science communicators. So you have your department and what, are your, what is your primary audience? Is it the underserved public? Because we need to not always preach to the converted, yeah, which I'm saying by preaching to the converted. Um, we don't necessarily maybe always want to reach the lay people, but we want to reach a broad audience. So again, same phenomenon, 79% saying our main target audience is actually the people who, who, who give us the money to do the research. 
That was never the idea of science communication. I'm sorry. Yeah, because you're essentially telling the people back who funded you why they funded you. I mean, that is not the form of communication that was initially intended. Um, yeah, I don't, don't want to leave it here too long. So just, just uh, as, a, as a snapshot of where we are today, what drives the thing. There's a, a book I published, I think, about eight years ago. You probably hardly read that uh, for those who are fluent in German. Vorhang auf Phase 5. It's like opening the fifth phase of science communication. Um, so I came up with this timeline back then, which I, in the meantime, see uh, a bit more differentiated, if you want. Yeah? Because obviously, these individual phases, which were dominant in different parts um, uh, of, the, let's say, the last couple of decades, obviously overlapped. And they didn't just stop, things actually continued. They um, also were not necessarily sequential in some areas. Some um, developments happened first and others later. But during these five phases, we could identify what we call certain deficit models. And first of all, we thought people don't know enough, then we thought they have a not the sufficient attitude to science, and then in the end, at the moment, I think it's very much about trust. We know that uh, certain aspects of trust in science are diminishing, are, are falling, the numbers. If you look into the Eurobarometer study, so something's going on and we are meant to respond to it as communicators. Important thing if we talk about knowledge is, I think, at that point to distinguish between knowing and ignoring something. If you ask that question, that's from a US survey here, is it true that human beings developed from earlier species of animals? It's, it might be a bit disappointing that not, every, not even every second American would agree to evolution, uh, to evolution theory. The thing is, from a, from a survey psychology point of view, if you ask the same question, adding a half sentence according to the theory of evolution, same question. Is it true that human beings developed from earlier species of animals? We would expect more or less the same answer, I guess. Yeah, Wouldn't be on the slide if it wasn't. So suddenly, the acceptance rate raises to 75%. So what's going on? People actually are aware of things. They know things. So it's, the challenge is less with what people know or don't know, but whether they actually actively refuse to accept something as being known. So in those five phases, with the three deficits, what um, uh, I wanted to also wanted to get across, what's in the title, which is a mouthful, isn't it? Um, that there are several generations of science communicators, and um, we started out basically with people whose natural talent it was to get the message across. You have the Neil deGrasse Tysons and um, the visible scientists. There's even a book by Declan Fry, which recently came out, The New Celebrity Scientist, which aren't that new actually anymore. But that's where we started out. Public communication as someone being talented to do it, being motivated, intrinsically motivated to do it by scientists and also public intellectuals. You shouldn't forget that it's not about just natural sciences, but it's also social science and economics and philosophers who are then part of the public intellectual discourse. The second phase is probably most of you guys. These are people who had some form of scientific training. You're originally physicists, biologists, um, chemists, historians, and then you got some form of a communication training in addition. PR, marketing, journalism, possibly even science communication, even though unfortunately I think you actually don't have a program in, um, here up in the north in Scandinavia. Um, so that, that is the vast majority of people. That is where we see the growth. Yeah, I mean, at the time when I was at university, we had one a long time ago, one communicator in the institution who did most of mostly everything, write the press releases, um, take the phone calls from journalists and do the a campus tour on the open day. Nowadays, here if you go to universities such as Aarhus in Denmark or um, here, here at Chalmers, um, you have institutions which have 30, 40, 70 people staff in science communication. So that is one of the largest increases in an industry, if you want, which we've ever actually experienced, faster than the automotive industry, for instance. So something ha has happened in the last 10, 15 years, which is absolutely, at least from a quantitative point of view, amazing. The third generation, which I want to focus on, um, and already coming to a close with my first input, would be how can we address the evidence base which we as scholars try to provide and how can we actually connect those fields, the practice and the evidence closer together. There is um, a very short video, I think it's only 30 seconds, so if you don't mind, I quickly, um, because I, I could explain it in five minutes, but we have a very good presentation. This is from the Sackler Colloquia for the Science of Science Communication, which there have been three. The last one was in November in Washington and they produced a video a while ago. <coughs> We use the scientific method to understand how the natural world works. We generate hypotheses. We observe, we measure, 
we analyze, we replicate. Yet, when it comes to communicating the meaning and significance of our discoveries, why do we so often use our intuition instead of science? The stakes are too high to rely on our hunches. Just think of all the critical topics in science that suffer from ineffective communication. It doesn't have to be this way. Social, behavioral, and decision scientists have made great progress in understanding how communication fails and succeeds. We should be as scientific about communication as about the science we are communicating. Okay. Um, the evidence base in training also the communicators means we have to, of course, start somewhere. We, for example, as I think it was already mentioned, have the privilege to have, which I think is the only full-fledged three-year program at the moment um, in Europe. And since we're an international university, it's all in English and even all for free, since Germany still believes in free education for everyone, which is a great thing. So first thing would be how to educate those, that, that, that next generation. You have, a, again, here a few ideas, for example, from social psychology, of concepts which give us a very good understanding of attitude formation in society, of how political processes and decisions are being made, of how individual people actually process information, how their information and how their like, information behavior and their decisions is being influenced. So psychology, for instance, tells us a lot about what, um, what, how we can influence positive, positively um, how people um, process information and how they make decisions. This is like putting it all into a nutshell. If people have the choice between the reassuring lie and the inconvenient truth, they kind of tend the other one. And there are lots of um, fascinating psychological experiments which empirically show why that is actually happening and how you can address that and how you can work with it. This is the conclusion from the handbook of the science of science communication, which is definitely worth reading. I think it's a bit on the expensive side, but maybe your institution can order it. Um, the misconception, and you can read it yourself, um, that this deficit model actually has proven difficult to dispel both from the communication models and from the scientific community. And I think the latter one is the most important bit here, because we have researchers who think the more information they provide, the better um, the attitude will be. So you can buy um, acceptance with more knowledge and more information. Again, empirically shown, um, this is not the case. There's no positive correlation. There's potentially even a negative one splitting communities into two. It's, at least it's a very complicated matter, and it's not as simple as that. Again, you have the link. You can browse all of that in detail, because I don't think we have the, um, <coughs> the time. Sorry. Um, today's science that we're talking about is, uh, is post-normal science. Yeah? You have a few, uh, description here, four elements. It's science where the facts are quite uncertain. So we have areas like nanotechnology, synthetic biology, where the values are still in dispute and society hasn't negotiated entirely yet as to whether we're supposed to do this or that and how far we're supposed to go with our values and norms. The stakes are very high, so if we mess this up, AI, yesterday, great example, if we don't address artificial intelligence appropriately and, and regulate it appropriately, this may actually end very badly for humankind as such, and the decisions are urgent, we don't have 10 years' time to think about how we want to regulate and deal and communicate nanotechnology, we need to do it now. The challenges um, are that what I'm talking about is almost entirely disconnected from your daily work. Again, um, we've done uh, surveys on that, about that. We've just conducted um, a global research field analysis analyzing several thousand um, research papers. Um, so the, the evidence is there, the scientific evidence. But practitioners are almost entirely unaware of that scholarship, if you want. The other way around, most of the research questions, or many of the research questions which our community addresses are also quite unrelated to the things that actually are going on in, pub in, in, in practice. So we have this disconnect between um, practice and theory, a reflective element in understanding um, why am I doing things, how, I, how could I pr um, uh, do things differently, the whole philosophy of science and, and sociology of science that comes into play, and the empirical research and the practice. 
The third disconnect is even within our communities. You have a communication scholar and a journalism scholar, a marketing scholar and an innovation management scholar. The four of them probably need half an hour to establish common ground and what they're actually talking about. We use different terminologies, we use different methods, we use different approaches, we actually don't talk to each other. We go to different conferences, so there's a disconnect within this very multidisciplinary community, which is only to a very limited extent interdisciplinary, which I think is a major challenge which needs to be addressed. Um, so that could be addressed by education, which is what um, we and others are doing, by offering programs. But in the end, talking about this today means we need half a decade for those graduates to actually take responsibility in the field, which means, um, oh, by the way, there's the, that's the shameless um, element of self-promotion here. So that's, <laughs> that's our program, but it's free of charge, so I don't have to sell it to you, but that's the short link to the, um, to the program. Um, we need an additional element of professional career development where um, uh, we offer courses. The question is, can we expect the practitioners community, uh, as we have expected it for a long time from the journalism community, to do this self-regulatory, to actually say, um, I'm aware of the fact that I need additional input, that I, that I want to develop further, or does there need to be some form of a top-down mechanism where governments, which is not happening in the first countries, are deciding we expect um, a minimum certification and qualification, formal qualification, from a science communicator if he or she is willing to take responsibility to communicate a project which, let's say, has a, has a research budget of five million crowns. Um, that is, I think, what will happen sooner or later in most countries. Some countries are further down the line with that discussion than others. There are even countries such as South Africa, um, China, Australia, where you have national science communication strategies, which gives us a science communication policy, which I find extremely interesting. But on the national level, the governments and the funding bodies and the research councils are thinking about how to incentivize and um, actually generate a certain form of communication. So that would lead to certification, um, would need to be de defining certain requirements of communication and national science communication policies. Again, second element of pro promotion, there's a summer school which we offer, a nine-day summer school, that's a STEAM summer school, very closely related to arts and science. I want to leave you with um, a short comic which may reflect what you're thinking about at the moment because taking on board um, scholarly evidence as to better understand um, what works and what doesn't, what is efficient, what is effective, um, measuring the impact and so on, might question to some extent what you're doing at the moment. It means that one of your beloved projects, that's my baby, that's my corporate publishing magazine or whatever, and you find out through evaluation that it actually does not correspond to the objectives and the goals that the institution has originally defined, then you may actually have to let go of that. That's, that can be hurtful. It means that the institutions and the communication structures in science communication, that, that those will be changing, and they are changing already quite dramatically at the moment when we think about RRI, responsive research and innovation, and things like that. So that is a cartoon which I think puts that into a nutshell. It's true, Hobbes. Ignorance is bliss. Once you know things, you start seeing problems everywhere, and once you see problems, you feel like you ought to try to fix them. And fixing problems always seems to require personal change, and change means doing things that aren't fun. I say fooey to that. But if you're willfully stupid, if you ignore evidence, you don't know any better, so you can keep doing whatever you like, yeah? kind of blending it out. The secret to happiness is short-term, stupid self-interests. We're heading for that cliff. Oh, I don't want to know about it. Whoa, and they're going down. I'm not sure I can stand so much bliss. Careful. You don't want to learn anything from this, do you? I hope you didn't just learn anything from the last 20 minutes, which I hope was only 20 minutes, but took away a few ideas. And I think we're having now a bit of a discussion now and a bit later, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alexander. We will get back to you very soon, but just a short question. You, you, uh, you were talking about three types of science communication. The natural talents, for example, scientists mm. are really good at communicating, former journalists, and also today the need of fully trained uh, science communicators. But you have a long background in journalism and PR before going into research. So what experiences did you do during, during those years? In which, in which way? Experiences in, as... In a way of um, 
lack of knowledge in certain mm. areas or understanding of people function psychologically oh. in oh, uh, total ignorance accepting uh, uh, the tot truth total ignorance i would say that um you know, you're being handed the, over this budget and you think, I'm a journalist, so I'm going to start a corporate publishing magazine. And then we had the best-selling science, probably a science magazine in, in Germany. Um, then we said, okay, we want to do political communication. I don't really know how that works, so just bring together a few politicians. And uh, I hope my former boss actually does, is not listening to this live stream. But um, you base your strategic decisions on intuition and you think, this is what I know, this is what I can do, this is what I like, so let's just do it. Yeah? You don't say like, um, I mean, I gave earlier this morning in the, in the seminar, I gave the example of the doctor. I don't want to be suggested an operation at my knee only because the doctor had a look at my ears. And he said, your ears don't look good, I'm sure your knee isn't fine either. Um, so I, I better want, I want a proper assessment, maybe stupid example, I know, but I, I would expect a proper assessment of what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats of a certain situation are before I make a strategic decision. And that is, I think, what I want to encourage. The challenge is that, again, uh, much of the evidence is pretty unrelated to practice. We would need a translatory mechanism, which we're working on. There's going to be an initiative later this year which is going to tackle that. Um, we need, in the other way around, we need uh, a listening mechanism to listen to what are the research questions that these colleagues are actually interested in. What should we do research on? And then adapt those and probably even transdisciplinarily do that research together between research and practitioners. Yeah? So that's what I'm... Um, burning for that's my um, as you say um, probably from personal experience because I only realized and years later um, uh, where I, my decisions probably fell short some of them seem to have worked anyway so maybe that's that disproves my hypothesis <laughs> but um, um, yeah I would very much like to see um, a, a much better link between scholarship and practice in our community we'll discuss more of that later yes under yep. okay Thank you, Alexander. Uh, our next speaker is the head of department of uh, media, cognition, communication at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, her, reach, he, her research focuses on the relationship between, between science and society, and in particular, the science te uh, technology. And in 2009, she was awarded the Science Communication Prize by the Danish Minister of Science. And in 2016, she, as Anne-Maria said, she published a book called Science Communication, Culture, Identity and Citizenship, of which she will share some thoughts uh, with you now. So please welcome Professor Maya Horst. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be standing here to be talking to you about something that I really enjoy talking about. Actually, science communication is a bit of something I do at this, on the side right now, because most of my time is spent being a university manager. So when I'm sometimes let out and get to go to places like this and talk about these things, then it just fills my heart with joy. So I've really been looking forward to come. Thank you, Anna Maria, for mentioning the book. Um, I wrote it with a very dear colleague, Sarah Davis. Um, we had a lot of fun writing it. Um, we went through lots and lots of different things in that book because we tried to write a book that would uh, sort of invite other people to join with us in a discussion about science communication and how we can look at it. But there's basically one point in the book, and that is that we need to look at it as something that's much more than just about making difficult things simple, or taking knowledge from those who have and give it to those who don't have. What we argue in the book is that science communication is a cultural phenomenon, that it's everywhere in society, and that it has huge influence and is influenced by other aspects of culture, but also identities and uh, citizenship. And what I'm going to do is, instead of giving you a long theoretical sort of expose about what we're saying, I will talk about um, an example. I will talk about uh, an installation that I did with other colleagues to communicate some of my research. And that's actually, when I received the prize from the minister, that was the first of those, oh, actually, the first two of those installations that I got that for. 
It takes a long time, and I know you all know what I'm talking about. Mostly, actually, researchers like myself don't have that hands-on experience. So I have so much more respect for science communication practitioners after I've done that. And what happened was in, um, in uh, 2014, the Europe Science Open Forum was held in Copenhagen. Uh, and I'm sure some of you might have thought, at least thought about going there. And uh, there was a big call for sort of people to do science communication. And I was asked, and of course I couldn't resist because doing these installations is also a lot of fun, even though it's also a lot of work. So now, of course, it's a long time. That installation has been and gone. I threw out the last bits of it only two weeks ago. But uh, I'm very happy to be here and standing and to sort of be able to revive it again. So let me start by just one theoretical slide. This is basically um, why I think science communication is important. Um, and these are big issues, big topics. Welfare, that's about the effectiveness of communication. That's about how if we don't communicate knowledge to those who need it, then of course that knowledge has no effect. So of course that's important. The other aspect, Ethel Forsberg uh, already talked about, uh, uh, also mentioning uh, the EU commissioner, that science communication is hugely important for democracy and for our ability to participate in democracy. And then finally, there's this issue of culture and identity, which is what I will be sort of talking about now. But uh, as I already said, I will try to sort of show it rather than tell it. Um, and then, of course, I'm very happy to take up the more theoretical discussions afterwards. Oh, I'd forgotten this. Of course, there was one more <laughs> theoretical slide, but this is the last one. But that's because that's to sort of tell you where this installation came from. Because I was doing a research project about the social responsibility of science at the time or before the ESOF conference. And when I was asked to do something, for the, for the Science in the City Festival, of course I thought that I, it should be something that actually started with current research that I was doing at that moment. And I was working on this paper that you can see here up in the right hand corner that I was writing with a PhD student of mine, Cecilie Gleop. And what we did was we were investigating because there was all this interest in the responsibility of science and research. And we were investigating how do scientists themselves think of of, of the responsibility of science. And what we came up with, we were looking in lots and lots of journals and articles, and what we came up with was, was that they had at least four different ways of thinking about the responsibility of science, and that those ways or ideals about responsibility were um, incommensurable, that they couldn't actually fit together because what was responsible for some scientists was exactly the opposite for other scientists. And we, uh, we've, we described this by uh, describing these four ideals, and I'm not going to talk very much about them, because in, instead of talking about these ideals, what we did with the installation was to try to create a landscape that people could go into and experience these um, ideals instead of being told about them. So, as Alex already introduced, sometimes a video says a lot more than a lot of words. So, let me just play this for you to demonstrate sort of a, a little bit of the idea behind the installation. Okay. Welcome to a digital tour of the installation, Breaking and Entering. Explore how science and society relate. There's no right or wrong way to meet the installation. The most important thing is curiosity and a desire to have your opinions challenged. The white tower in the middle of the installation presents four different perspectives on the ideal relationship between science and society. These ideals contain very diverse understandings of the social responsibility of science. Each entrance represents one ideal, and hence a certain understanding of the role of science in society. At the counter, you can pick up an iPad and use it to find a number of images throughout the installation and scan them. When you scan an image, a video starts and elaborates on the subject that the image represents. In entrance one, you can build on to the scientific structure and maybe contribute to the development of true knowledge. 
Here, science is separated from society, and the scientists decide themselves which areas need attention. In entrance two, you, as a scientist, have to look out into society and be aware of its problems and challenges. Science has to focus on research that works to solve these problems. In entrance three, you as a citizen can say which societal problems you believe should be solved. Then it's the job of politicians and society to choose the most important problems that science should work to solve. In entrance four, a close collaboration and open dialogue between scientists and citizens ensures that the most important problems of society are solved. Around the White Tower are several stations where you can let your opinion be heard. Among other things, you can write down your hopes and fears for the future, consider the degree of risk that science can cause, or cast a vote on who should prioritize funds for scientific research. All the examples used in the installation are based in the new field synthetic biology and the solutions and problems that this field poses. There are no easy answers or quick solutions, but by exploring the relationship between science and society, you're already off to a good start. If you want more information, please go to www.breaking/entering.dk. So basically what we did was we transferred these four ideals into four different ideal typical scientists. And then, um, as you might have seen, that this white tower had four rooms and each of them had an entrance. And at the entrance there was a scientist talking about sort of how he saw the responsibility of science. And um, when, when you went into the uh, tower, there was some kind of jigsaw or puzzle, something you could do with your hands. This is the first ideal, what we call demarcation, where the idea is that science has to be sort of secluded from society in order to be um, responsible so that it doesn't get um, corrupted by social interests like money and power. And when you were in there, you could build on this, um, okay, I'm not sure, you could build on these, with these structures to kind of build more. And then you could uh, see this video which was giving a little bit more of an explanation. Maybe your contribution to the structure is the missing link. Science develops as scientists elaborate on each other's work. Every time someone shares a small piece of knowledge through publication, the whole becomes larger and more nuanced. Scientists are often driven by curiosity to understand everything we don't yet know about the world. Everyone hopes that their contribution is central but it can take a long time before the meaning of each piece becomes clear. So the third ideal was about contribution. That's an ideal that focuses on uh, how society is, is, should be able to ask questions of science. So here's some money, and in return of this money, we would like solutions to the social problems that we have. So we asked people to write down the problems that they would like science to work on. And I'm going to show you a list, uh, and I want to say before you start reading it, that these were the first 15 answers in English. So I haven't actually uh, sorted them. I had these are the sort of representative of what people would write. So here they go. I wish that we were able to travel to other stars, climate change, research on why people have knowledge e.g. about health or climate change, but don't act on their knowledge. Too much inconsideredness about the environment. I'd like to see an end to socialism. I would like to find out how we build the hospitals of the future so that they match future challenges. I want a fucking unicorn. The Riemann conjecture, world will survive. There won't be any illnesses. I still love her and cancer. And the reason why I said this about not uh, sort of selecting in them is because this actually brilliantly demonstrates my point about culture. That when people participate in science communication, they're not just thinking about the sort of science or the knowledge. All the rest of their life comes into how they in engage and interact with this. So of course, this person who wrote, I still love her, has this on his or her mind. This is an important point. 
we don't know whether it's meant as a sort of ironic comment or whether it's meant very seriously that science should sort of find cures to unhappy love. The same as the, the thing about the unicorn. So, well, that might very well be a joke. On the other hand, the whole theme of the installation was synthetic biology. So it's not actually so strange to think that some people thought, well, if you're going to engineer biological uh, systems, you know, there's really one thing I would like. I love those unicorns. I loved them when I was small, and now I would like one. So if you could actually make whatever I want, I would like one of those. But of course, it could also be a, a, a sort of a, a, an ironic comment. The point here is that I think it's been very common, so, or at least sometimes when I present this, some people say, oh, but that's, come on, they don't take it seriously. People ought to be take science more seriously than that. But actually, I think exactly the point that they start interacting with it, that it sort of influences with the rest of the life, demonstrates that science communication becomes much more important rather than something we do in a little reserve over here. But it's actually something where people's lives uh, sort of interact with how they're interacting with the science communication. So the last tower was about integration, and that's an ideal that uh, is saying that in order to be responsible, because we've already, Alex talked a little bit about post-normal science, and this ideal very much is, is sort of linked to that, it, and it's this idea that today science is so complex and it's so intermingled uh, with the rest of society that we have to have scientists collaborating with people outside science in order for science to be responsible and useful. And we demonstrated that by having a sort of room in the tower that was quite open, as you can see it here. And the jigsaw, or the puzzle that, that people could do, was actually a, a jigsaw, and it consisted of six pieces that were uh, connected to the tower with elastic bands. So you needed six hands in order to hold it together. And there was only space for one person inside the tower. So you had to collaborate with people outside in order to sort of put the jigsaw together. And once you'd done that, you could uh, get a little explanation about that. In modern societies, problems and their solutions are so complex that scientists have to work with many other groups. Only by involving all affected parties can you make sure that science deals with the most important issues and that the solutions created are in line with the values and needs of a society. Many different people and groups can contribute and it's important that every contribution is respected. So People weren't just invited into these four rooms. They were also outside. There was these stations where we were trying to inter engage people in sort of interactive things. And uh, one of the things we did was we asked people who should decide. Society gives certain resources to science, so who do you think should prioritize funds? And then there was these six different categories that you could vote for. Uh, and then you could also listen to each of uh, these. There was a researcher, you could listen to the arguments of a researcher and so on. And here I have the, the argument of the politician. We need to prioritize research that can create growth and new jobs for this country. We have to be at the forefront of the knowledge society. That is why we need to focus on innovation and technology. For too long, scientists have sat in their ivory towers. It is time for them to come out and take an interest in how science can become relevant for society. Oh, let's... So here was another... Um here was another question which was about responsibility for the responsible use of science. And again, the same thing where you could vote for different... Uh, actors sort of say, and the way you voted was by putting little colored pegs into these. It's actually, I know it looks a bit like uh, loud um, loudspeakers, but it is actually holes in these six um, hexagons. And you could put these little uh, uh, colored pegs in. And this is on the first day, and then a bit later it looked like this, and then it looked like this. And you might not 
see it so clearly, but to me it's very visible that where most people vote is in the politicians and the scientists. And we've had, uh, the designer and I who've made these installations, we've basically had a similar question in all the three installations that we've had. And it's more or less always the case that people tend to vote mostly for those two groups. Although, as you can also see, there's quite a lot of other pegs. Now I should say, we don't actually think that this is a sort of truly representative uh, answer to how the visitors thought who should decide. The point of putting this in as an exercise is actually mostly to get people to reflect on their own opinions, to make them think about who they think should decide, and also to make it visible what other people decided, and then to let people, we are trying also to let people reflect on how does it, and does it influence their vote when they can see what other people voted for. So I skipped this one, um, because that was one thing that was about risk. And what we did there was we asked people about um, risk, what is the treatment worth? And then they were asked, so if, so say this is true, so sci uh, scientists have made a cure for a, a serious disease that might cure a million people worldwide. There's only this thing that some people might have an adverse reaction, so they might be seriously ill from this cure, in, from this treatment instead of being cured. So how many people do you think it's fair to put at risk in order to save one million worldwide? And then what they had to do was to take these elastic bands and put them around how many of those people they would put at risk. And um, I have I want to talk about this because this particular feature was the one that the synthetic biologists that we worked with, they really hated this, or at least they tried to, to sort of talk us out of having it. Um, whereas actually, I think that they were wrong. <laughs> I think that this was actually one of the things that we should do a lot more science communication about. And let me just play the little video for you. Um, that people could find here. Modern societies have created large and elaborate systems for the approval of new medicines. This has been done because we don't want to risk the marketing of new medicines that will make people ill. But it has a price. Because the approval process is so elaborate, it's very expensive to develop new medicines. That's why many medical companies focus on illnesses that affect a lot of wealthy people. It's here that the ability to pay is highest. However, this system makes it more difficult to raise money for the development and approval of medicine for rare illnesses and for illnesses that affect the poorer parts of the world. And the reason why I think this is important is because I think currently this is one of the biggest questions in medical research that we are not taking when we are discussing science communication. We have some very big pharmaceutical companies in Denmark and they all have the same. They would like someone else to make the argument that we make here, but they don't know how to make it themselves. And the politicians don't want to make it either. And I can totally understand why the scientists would go, ooh, this is dangerous. Why do we have to talk about risk in relation to synthetic biology? Will that not just make everyone be very emotional? But I actually think that this is a really, really pertinent question that we need to have more public debate about. And by showing you, I think that what you can do is you can actually in, um, introduce something like this. It's a huge question. Introduce it relatively simply, like in this way, and then let people go away with it and then find out how they're going to think about that by themselves. Because that's another point of our book is that we actually trust that people, given sort of the ability and the space to think themselves actually are able to make very reasoned arguments about these things. So I'm coming to an end now. I just wanted to give you this picture of, uh, that was another of the interactive features. People could write their hopes for the future on green notes and their fears for the future on red notes. And I love this picture between, because these two guys and another guy, they were in this installation for almost an hour. We have lots of, because they were there when the, the photographer was there. And uh, 
it's, it's one thing that I have found. I had no idea that this would be the case, but it actually turns out that making science communication in this way engages quite a lot of these young men. They uh, seem to spend almost more time there than uh, some, of the, some of the other groups that we had in there. So, as people left, we asked them to vote for which ideal would they agree with most. Uh, they were pla placing little magnets on those black stripes there. Uh, and again, the point is not to see what do people vote for, but to make them reflect about what um, they would think. So, I hope that this has kind of illustrated a way of doing science communication that thinks of citizens as sort of exactly that, as citizens, but also as people who are part of a much broader dialogue about the role of science in society. And uh, I've made here a list of all the lovely people that helped me. I mean, of course, I didn't do this on my own. In fact, all the nice things you see in the video, the videos are made by our students, and it's the designer, Birte Delsko, who made the installation. I'm just the one who does the talking, but... Um, it's just, it's, it's been fantastic and it's really a fun thing to do. So thank you for letting me talk about it and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Maya. Um, you talk about science being a part of our culture and mm -hmm. also science communication now being a part of our culture. But um, what can you do to make science <laughs> communication, and most of the science com communication you see, is that designed to be a part of culture? What can you do to sort of make science communication a part of culture if you work yeah. in a university? Thank you, that's a great yeah. question. Because actually I think that that very much depends on how you look at sci what you define as science communication. And I think that we have a rather narrow way of defining it as sort of things that are done by scientists and science communicators in very particular formats. But one of the point about saying this thing of identity is that all the time when scientists are talking about who they are as scientists or talking about science, they're always doing science communication and they're not just telling something about the facts that, and the content of what they're talking about. They also communicate something about science by the way they look, the way they act, the way they, they um, perform themselves. And let me just give you one example. Right now we have a lot of, very rightly so, concern that we want more young people to take up uh, careers in science, particularly women in STEM disciplines and things like that. But sometimes I'm very worried that in order to do that, we present all these glossy images of scientists and we take people like Brian Cox, we have celebrity scientists in Denmark as well. And the problem of course is that a normal PhD or postdoc, when they look at their daily life, that doesn't look like that glossy picture. So I'm scared sometimes that we are actually telling all the normal scientists that there's something wrong with the way their life is because it doesn't comply with that glossy image that we have. And I think that if we start looking at this, then we see science communication so many places. And um, we mentioned Declan Fay or Alex did, but we could also mention another of our good colleagues, David Kirby in Manchester, who's doing research on science in, in Hollywood. So in the big movies, and he has these wonderful stories about how NASA, for instance, collaborate a lot with the Hollywood producers. Uh, he was showing this brilliant uh, uh, bit from Dante's Peak, where yeah. this scientist is, is they, they're fixing a problem by finding an old gadget that NASA has left, and the guy says, thank you, NASA, thank you, NASA, thank you, NASA. And, you know, it's quite obvious why NASA thinks it's worthwhile to be part of this. But actually, we could look into that and we would see science communication so many places that are already there. I mean, it is culture. This is the thing that culture is. Mm. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll also ask uh, Alexander to come up on stage, please. And we have already received some questions from uh, the audience. Maybe there are more coming up. First, I would like to ask you, ask you both, you, you're both talking about what other people expect from science communication, what is the main mm -hmm. goal or main purpose, but 
For you, from your point of view or the research you have done, what would you consider being the main purpose today for science communication? Well, overall, I think it is welfare, democracy and culture, and that's a pretty tall order. So I think in, in practice, when you're actually doing something, you have to cut that down to what makes sense. So for instance, when we've done our installations, we basically boil it down to one question. Can we design this in a way so that people who come into this installation can find meaning in it? That's the most important thing, because we don't want to waste people's time and we want for them to think that it's worthwhile. And secondly, can we design it so that they take something of all the social science and humanities research that went into this so that they can take that away? But I would much rather that people come, come into those installations, enjoy themselves and get curious about something concerning science, broadly seen, than that they particularly understand exactly what my research is about. I don't think that's the most important thing. I think the engaging with science, the curiosity, the wanting, also the wanting to ask critical questions, but that kind of engagement, that's the most important thing. And let me just say one more thing. That is crucial, because right now, we're living in a society where I'm not so scared of new fake news, because I think we've always had that phenomenon. But we have a society that gets more and more um, distributed and segregated. And we actually risk right now that we create a society where some people understand, evaluate, use scientific knowledge, and a lot of other people don't. And they are not going to want to fund it, they're not going to want to use it, and ultimately they're not going to accept that science is part of society. That's a dangerous situation. So the first thing you have to do is really to engage people and then yeah. draw them in and solve the other problems. Mm. Do you agree, Alexander? Mm. Yeah, very much so. It's, um, I would even maybe emphasize the point why we maybe should not do it, right? <laughs> which of course is um, rephrasing the question a bit if you don't mind. Because I showed it in the beginning, the vast majority of objectives in, in our work, in your work, is, is promotion and is positioning the institution in an increasingly competitive environment. Um, on the other hand, we're all pragma pragmatists, I suppose we all know that this is the case. We all know how to apply for Horizon grants and, and what have you, so this is the game, and we have to play by the rules of the game. But that's why that discussion should not necessarily only be, be between those who do it in practice and us who look at it and try to analyze it and evaluate it, but there's also the policy element in it. I, th I know that there are a few policymakers actually in the audience. Uh, Vinova is there, there are uh, so the research yeah. councils and so on. Um, so that is a discussion which I find extremely interesting that um, science communication has reached a level of impact where we're talking about thousands of people doing something and having an enormous impact on how people think about things. You mentioned pop culture, yeah, where I remembered the Martian with Matt Damon saying, mm. I'm going to science the shit out of this. <laughs> this is what, uh, that's what was the movie quote for me uh, last year, I think it was. Um, so it has an enormous impact, and we should actually assume that governments have a huge um, intrinsic interest in having a say in how we communicate. And this is what I see in very few countries. And I'm, I'm not a fan of top-down regulation in a way, but um, I'm also uh, been probably too long um, in the community and in, in the business to assume that this is going to sort itself out by self-regulation at some point. Yeah? So setting the objectives more towards an upstream engagement versus the promotional and marketing and uh, positioning the institution, um, I think needs some form of top-down mechanism particularly in a time when we are losing, um, to a large extent in Western countries, what the French call the correctif, the correcting element mm -hmm. of science journalism, reflecting, contextualizing, questioning what it is that we're doing. If we're, if we're losing that, strengthen the institutional communication, missing the gatekeepers, disintermediating the whole system, then that puts a lot of responsibilities on the shoulders of those practitioners out there, and we should think very carefully about why we're doing things. Not necessarily always about how, mm. but why. So do you believe the main responsibility for performing science communication is with the science communicators or with the scientists themselves? <laughs> I think it has to be a shared one. Because I think that uh, science communicators cannot do it on behalf of scientists. It has to have scientists involved. On the other hand, 
I very much agree with the points that Alex made on how um, scientists basically do communication out of sort of their intuition. And some of them are really, really good at it. And they've listened to professional advice along the way. But we need to make it more sort of systematically good and effective and useful. Do you, would you like to add something? Yeah. About Should I quickly? I think um, also the job profile as it is changing is mm. more your role is a managerial one. Yeah? You're part of the team or even um, supervising a department of dozens of people. And someone has to organize the political communication, the risk communication, the uh, regulatory affairs and all of those things. Um, but you need the authentic voice in the picture. And those are the people actually behind the lab bench, standing there and actually doing it in practice. Yeah? But um, we had that discussion this morning. It's also a bit unfair, if, you're, if we're honest, mm -hmm. that you can expect researchers to spend a significant amount of their time in public communication if everything that counts for their careers is papers being published and third party funded being a, a third party funding being acquired yeah. um, so i think we have also um, a imbalance between uh, suddenly an expectation of you need to do this in addition to everything else and but what counts actually for your career for the evaluation of projects for the evaluation of entire institutions is everything but communication and there's something wrong there as well but can uh, i add something yeah. to that because i think that that's also something that scientists tell themselves and it's a convenient thing to complain i mean the probably Swedish scientists are different, but the <laughs> Danish scientists, they have ways of finding things to complain about, usually managers, so I know what I'm talking about, but also everyone else, basically. And I think it is very clear these days that for most scientists, you can't even do your science if you can't communicate it. It's not that you might have to talk to the general public, but you certainly have to sell what you're doing to funders and to the managers, to students, to attract the best students, all these sort of arenas where you have to be able to communicate. And, and I use the word sell, but you could also say actually engage enthusiasm and you know support for your research. And you have to do that. And a lot of the scientists actually will admit to this. So I think they also know that it's, it's much more part of the doing of science rather than being an add-on, which it might have been before. So do, do you mean that uh, like, uh, the, the science communication or the, the engagement stops there in f getting the right funding and the right students and the higher purpose is forgotten? No, because I think actually that it's a sort of circular movement. There is this, some of you might have heard, people can talk about the Matthew effect in science, that those who have funding generate a lot of research, which makes them able to get more funding. And I think science communication is part of this. So, so all the good science communicators that we have, they, um, they will talk about the research that they're doing as a way also of generating for support for their next research projects. Mm. So it's, it's part of a cycle. Alexander, would you like to add anything? Yeah, only maybe the point, I can only underline it. Um, again, defining communication. If it's about explaining and dumbing down whatever it is that they're doing so that everyone understands it and you already ruled that out, you're saying, no, that's not what we need to talk about, yeah, then, then I would be skeptical of such an approach. But if we accept um, a researcher to actively construct, let's say, a social robustness for whatever she or he is doing, to anticipate societal needs, expectations, worries, anxieties, take that on board, while doing the research, even maybe before and while drafting it transdisciplinarily, instead of then afterwards wondering why people hate him or her for doing animal experiments. Yeah? Why don't we bring in the people? Earlier? If that's communication, then I would say, is there any argument for a researcher not doing that nowadays anymore? Just one sentence. Um, the Rome Declaration by the European Commission from 2015 actually defines research is only excellent if it relates to societal needs. So you can do as excellent as you want in your um, lab science, in your experiments, in your research ethics, in your methodologies. If you don't respond to societal needs, your research is not considered excellent anymore. That's a statement. So, Shall uh, we get a question from the audience? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, this is for Alexander, but maybe you can both ask it, uh, answer it. Uh, scientists are often <laughs> negative to get too involved 
in, in policy making. Is that a problem or not? They're negative in what? Scientists are often negative to get too involved in policy making. Mm. Is that a problem or not? They don't want to be involved in policy making. Mm. Or yeah, that, I guess th that's, that's how I yeah, yeah. Yeah, understand the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's a big one. <laughs> Good question. Whoever asked. Um, well, that's a really big one. I mean, because uh, science, as we probably would all agree, should have an influence on political decisions being made. If the European Parliament says um, that biotechnological research um, uh, can be, you know, the decision on that can be done made by every single country, this opt-out decision that was made two years ago, and the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, does not necessarily have to say that. So we, we have established institutions which are there to provide us with the evidence, and then the parliament decides, actually, we know we, you don't need to use that evidence, even though we're paying for it. So political decisions like these should actually not be happening without a strong voice of the scientific community. And we had to have a long history in Brussels, for instance, with a chief science advisor who was then kind of mm. driven out of office and um, different mechanisms that changed. But this whole thing is so complex. I mean, we teach it for a whole year, just political communication, science advocacy, um, uh, technology assessment, um, participatory elements in it, um, corporate foresight, how to actually, how lobbyists try to influence that agenda, how they are again regulated in terms of transparency mechanisms and so on. So um, it's, it's easy to say researchers should engage with policy making, but there's also a danger in that because it's actually a really complicated matter. You can easily make mistakes. Um, as a reviewer, if you just give your um, account as to your, you're called into a committee and then you give your review and uh, in the end the, the committee makes a decision, um, that's one thing, but I think the, the question suggests a bit a much more active role. And I think that could almost be a dangerous thing if it's done by people who don't have that understanding of how that is being cherry-picked, misused, misinterpreted. Yeah, the, let's say the statistical literacy of a policymaker is also not necessarily <laughs> rocket high. So maybe we have to get back so to that question during yeah. the, the coffee break because we have several questions from uh, the audience. Yes, we have uh, a question here. <laughs> Where are people looking for information? And based on this, where should researchers be actively communicating? <laughs> So Do you want to go first where? on that one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have lots to say on that. If I say in the lecture room the term television, my students don't talk to me for three weeks. So what's, what's wrong with this guy, this, this machine in the corner where he switches us on in the evening and things, the uh, news are on. Uh, so of course I know what streaming is, yeah? I'm, I'm aware of, um, not here, but seriously, um, understanding the what we call information behavior, yeah? so mm -hmm. how people actually um, look for information, how they process it, um, that has changed so dramatically that even we as media scholars, as communication scholars, struggle with catching up, but actually we're not catching up, we're actually far behind to be honest. Um, but that means we have to understand those filter bubbles, we have to understand the echo chambers and all the mechanisms at play. And that's again where the evidence comes in. Um, a science communication professional today has that psychological, systemic, a media economic understanding of what's actually going on and how people process that information. And I think then you know that um, it's online and it's all online. Everyone under 40, I suppose, does not regularly read a newspaper anymore. We had that this morning um, uh, in, our, in our seminar. Um, you still maybe have a university rector who might be even older than I am, <laughs> who might be of the assumption the most important thing is that we are in the regional newspaper. And then you tell them, well, you know, I've, I've asked the last 200 incoming students, not a single one of them actually knows that that newspaper exists. So maybe you have a, like, two, two totally different realities. Yeah. It sounds funny, is it really? Yeah, because that consumes resources. You dedicate then resources on bl doing media relations with regional journalists who, um, you know, you know, I don't want to rule out things, I don't want to paint things too black and white, but I think it helps here to see that we're not necessarily addressing the people where they are. Um, the same thing with science centers and museums, that it mainly addresses people who actually go there in the first place, instead of things like pop-up shops, which you mentioned, going, as the Americans say, you have to fish where the fish are. Mm. Yeah. Maya? Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, so I was going to say, Actually, I want to work more with YouTube, and I don't know anything about YouTube, but thank God I have two sons, and they are <laughs> going to help me with this, because it's so clear that my generation has already... I mean, we have to go and work with the young ones in order to understand this. And I think there was two sides of the question. So the, f the latter one part of it is easy to answer, because, well, at least in the general, because, of course, we should be where the people are. We shouldn't... I mean... 
it's about it's not about where they are sort of where we want them to be it's about <laughs> finding out where are they and they are exactly like you say not in those channels that elites like us are used to use but but i think people don't necessarily go looking for information i think that's one of the mistakes that scientists and science communication uh, people often make that there's some people out there who's looking for this so what we have to do is we actually have to go and sell and give people something that they might not know that they want. So of course we have to think very much about where are they? What is it that they do want? And then latch on to that mm -hmm. need, that motivation. One, just very quickly, there was in 97 or 98, there was an American physicist who announced that he was going to clone uh, babies for childless couples and this was pretty crazy I mean it was just after Dolly the sheep and it was pretty crazy and there was no idea that he couldn't do it but the sort of smart science communication scientists they used this as an opportunity to talk about how difficult it was to clone Dolly how many ethical and other questions there would be if you were cloning people and just sort of went with the story whereas the kind of less smart ones they went ah, that's a stupid question I'm not going to answer that and that's just not the right attitude except that no matter how crazy people come with I mean how crazy the ideas are that people come with just use it as a platform, use it as an opportunity. Just start from there and to see why is it that people might have this so-called crazy idea. They might have very good reasons for why they believe what they believe, but this is an opportunity to try to change that. Just a very short <laughs> question, last question that you have to also answer shortly. Good uh, luck. What, if you can answer <laughs> it, this is interesting. What can you say about Swedish science communication? <coughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think, and this is purely uh, prejudice, so uh, don't kill me. <laughs> I think I have always thought of Swedes as more serious, more fact-based, but therefore also maybe slightly more boring. But that's <laughs> for you to decide. <laughs> Danes are still, now I'm purely making the connection, right? Dan the comparison. Danes in comparison are silly. They exactly think you can talk about cloning people because it's a, but not all of them, of course. But I think, I think actually what I'm seeing is that Sweden is coming a long way. And compared to that, well, or coming a long way, but actually I think there's lots and lots of interesting stuff going on in Sweden which I'm very sad to say I don't see going on in Denmark. I think that the Danes were extremely advanced in the 80s and 90s, and we were just rolling out with a science communication agenda that was focused on uh, deliberation and dialogue and engagement. Mm. Some of you might have heard about consensus conferences that Border Technology did, that, uh, that was very... Um, kind of world famous, mo much more famous outside Denmark than in Denmark. And what's happened since, and I have colleagues, including, uh, I've also self-written about this myself, but basically our story is that when everyone else kind of moved forward, Denmark kind of moved backwards. So I think that so Sweden, fact -based is, but Sweden is part <laughs> of moving <laughs> forwards. <Okay>. Alexander, <laughs> short answer. Mm. Oh, it's yeah, easy sorry. because I don't know too much, too much about <laughs> okay. it. But if that's a Dane... Could you say something else than fact-based and boring? <laughs> <If> <laughs> ah, come on, that, that wasn't the only thing I said. <laughs> <coughs> well, seriously, but if, if that's a Dane talking about Swedes being apparently boring, <laughs> uh, I wonder how she would talk about Germans. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, then, I mean... I'm quoted to German, so... We certainly <laughs> qualify. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, and again, I don't know too much about the Swedish situation. I've been here now a few times uh, in the last couple of months um, and very much enjoyed the conversation we had and the, the, the presentations I um, was honored to give. What I find interesting that there seems to be a policy discourse when it's about this, this concordat that universities, I think, in, uh, are planning to sign, that the government is thinking about some form of framework. That's a discussion which I could only encourage the community with every energy that I have that is something that you should be doing, and I think you should also have the courage to um, go the extra mile and actually aim for something aspiring instead of just writing something in a document which you're doing anyway. Set some goals, and that might mean that the Swedish science communication community could leapfrog 
um, way across others, even the Danes, if necessary. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Maya Horst and Alexander Gerber. Uh, before you leave the stage, we have a, a gift for you. <laughs> a gift for you. <laughs> Oh, thank uh, you. I will switch to Swedish now. Uh, nu är det dags för er strax att gå till era parallella seminarier. Uh, ni som ska lyssna till uh, samarbetet mellan Stiftelsen för strategisk forskning och uh, Bonnier ägda tjänsten KIT. Ni ska vara här i Draken. Uh, ni som vill veta hur man lockar unga till teknikutbildningar via Youtube-stjärnor. Ja, vi har ju talat om Youtube här och här ja. får ni lära er allt om hur man ska göra för att synas och lyckas på Youtube. Precis. Precis. Och då håller man till i Greta, så då går man rakt ut och tar till vänster och sen går längst ner i korridoren där, så hittar man dit. Och sen forskning och humor under samma tak med Fritte Fritsson och Riksbankens jubileumsvån. Uh, ni ska vara i kongresssalen som är ut här till höger när ni kommer ut. Men först är det fika. Seminarierna startar klockan 15. Nej, förlåt. 16. Och 15. Klockan Sorry. 15. Och efter och. seminarierna yes. så har ni sett att man kan köpa Emma Frans bok ute i foajén. Och i pausen efter de parallella sessionerna så sitter hon och signerar den om man vill ha den signerad. Så passa på att få Skaffa boken och få den signerad. Ja. Och så samlas vi alla här igen klockan 16. Inget annat. Välkomna tillbaka. Tack så länge.